Kobe Health Show, everybody. I'm here with master trainer Jonathan Simos. Thanks for coming back on the show, Jonathan. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate you having me back. Yeah, we had a great interview the first time, and you have learned and experimented with several new things since we talked. So this will be really exciting. The latest in exercise science, right? Yes, thank you. I, uh, I've been trying to get as many certifications as possible. So I uh, commit to about an hour a day studying for the next certification. So I've gotten about uh, 12 or 13 since last time we talked. That's crazy. And let, let, let me read for those of you who don't know Jonathan or didn't listen to our last interview. Uh, Jonathan is a master trainer, a drug-free athlete, and has multiple certifications. I'll just name a few. Uh, Precision Nutrition One, which is the same certification I have for nutrition. Certification in Applied Functional Science from the Gray Institute, OT Fit, Performance Enhancement Specialist from NASM, FMT Movement Specialist, Certified Glute Specialist, Corrective Exercise Specialist, Stretching and Flexibility Coach. And Jonathan, that's halfway through the list. So uh, in addition, he has a unique cross-training style called New Exist. Uh, did I say that right? Yes, you did. New Exist. New Exist. Uh, which is a performance-oriented functional program that empowers you with fitness education while promoting deeper ideals of health, wellness, and overall functionality. That's quite a lot you have bitten off for yourself <laughs> to, uh, to not only get all those certifications, but to create something so... A big you've got a big vision for this thank you yes i'm still working on it i'm still putting it together uh that's part of the reason why i'm getting the credentials um but i have a passion for uh empowering others with fitness education because i had to learn the hard way as a teenager and suffered many imbalances and injuries as i mentioned in the last the last time we spoke um so through finding the uh, gaining the credentials to fix myself i found a passion for teaching others so this venture stems from that because there's a gap in the industry from uh, many people don't know where to start in beginning their fitness journey. Okay. And so I talked to many of those people. We have many of those people in our world who, uh, who envy those who work out all the time and wish they could be like that. But for whatever reason, you know, a lot of people, there's kind of two types of people in elementary school, those that love gym class and those that hate gym class. Right? There's kind of, you know, uh, it's obviously oversimplification, but 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 really right from a young age, there's some kids who uh, maybe just were raised differently. Maybe it was a more of an academic upbringing than a physical upbringing or who knows what. And other kids who are introduced to health and fitness at a young age and take up a sport, soccer, swimming, something, and they just love it. So let's start with that, that group that struggles, the group that maybe their parents didn't really exercise. It's not part of their family tradition, but they want to break the mold. They want to be that generational, transformational character that introduces health and fitness into their family. Uh, how do they start? They're 30 years old, 20 pounds overweight, and a programmer. Let's just take that avatar, and, yeah. and, and they're ready to get fit. Perfect. Um, it, uh, I would say first, adopting the right mindset. So understanding that uh, not to approach working out with, you know, oh, I have to do this, but more of realizing it's a privilege. You know, you get to work out, you get to feel good, you get to get these benefits. So approaching with the right mindset and uh, really, um, you know, valuing the workouts and understanding it's a journey because uh, fitness is a journey, symbolic of life. You know, you have to commit to goals, you have to work to goals, uh, you learn discipline, you learn camaraderie. Um, so there's a lot of different components with that. But uh, so first step is understanding that um, it's a, a mental shift. So valuing those workouts and then understanding your why. So coming up with that, that fundamental reason, uh, well, actually deeper reason for working out. If it's, uh, as we spoke last time, to touch on that briefly, um, to dig deep and find out what your why is, what's motivating you. Is it more just to lose the weight to, you know, look better in, in your uh, opinion, or is it to be able to, you know, have better quality of life and play with your grandkids? Uh, you know, so finding your reason to motivate you and then taking that, then you can determine more of uh, your schedule, what you com can commit to. So if you can commit to three days a week at the gym or two days a week at the gym, so you need to have that framework before you can start dialing in. So once you understand uh, you can commit three days a week, then you can break it down and, you know, to more detail so you can do full body three days a week and you want weight training for sure. Weight training 
uh, flexibility training, so flexibility, mobility, and uh, also the cardiovascular side, uh, because cross training is very important to have uh, you know peak fitness, uh, functional fitness, um, and also it will make you more resilient to injuries. So you definitely want that that foundation, and I can touch on that more as well. Sounds good. And definitionally, when we say cross training. Uh, what we really mean is a variety of different types of exercise so that we're not getting in a rut. It's not like bench press on Monday and squats on Wednesday and, you know, shoulders on Friday, right? So we're, we're, we're talking about a, a mixed variety of types of exercises and, and creating muscle confusion in our routine. Yes, you uh, you do want to learn the movement patterns first. So you have to learn the fundamental movement patterns, uh, which would be uh, lunging, squatting, hip hinge, which would be the basis for deadlifts and different exercises that have that hip hinge. Uh, horizontal push, which is chest movements, horizontal pull, which is more upper back, vertical push, vertical pull. So the body only does a series of movements. So once you learn these uh, fun fun fundamental movements, then uh, through high reps, you know, slow, controlled, high reps, your nervous system starts to, um, you know, encode them. So it becomes second nature over time. So once you learn that foundation, then you can start loading it and getting into uh, lower rep ranges with more weight. So uh, you do want to train all rep ranges, but you have to build that foundation first. So uh, what I see in group fitness a lot is um, a lot of uh, newcomers who have never worked out, you know, a day in their life, they'll jump into group fitness which is great that they have that, uh, that you know, courage and, and excitement. Uh, but the downside is, um, there's a phrase, you can't shoot a cannon from a canoe. So uh, a lot of them have injuries because they don't, their joints aren't ready for the, uh, the impact, the force. So you have to really build that foundation, which, you know, slow, steady, high reps, learning those movement patterns. Then as your muscles get stronger, your joints get stronger, your bones get denser, then you can work into lower rep ranges eventually into that power range and then jump into group fitness classes. Um, so uh, there's a right way to do things. Do you start people with body weight only exercise? Body weight is great, um, but you don't have to stick with just body weight because um, it can be challenging to do certain movement patterns. So uh, doing a horizontal pull can be a little tough body weight unless you have T-Rex straps. Uh, but it is great. It is great to start body weight. Or you can start really light with a uh, cable machine, you know, single arm, horizontal pull to learn that horizontal pull movement. Um, so there's different ways to do it, but once you learn those movement patterns, then you can build. And a lot of people don't realize, uh, like you mentioned, how uh, a lot of people will stick with the same exercises, the same order. You actually want to, well, first, not all exercises are created equal. So uh, curls aren't gonna have the same training effect as you know uh, squats, because bigger muscle groups, more training effect. <laughs> Also, yeah. you want to change the order of the exercises every few workouts to prevent imbalances because you get the best training effect early on. So if you always start with, you know, squats, then chest press, then back, your chest is going to get more ch training effects than your back. So you want to change the order every few workouts. Uh, and then also rep ranges. You want to change the rep ranges the most frequently. So uh, last point uh, to touch on for now with this, um, the... There were two, there was a study, one group did the same exercises for like a year, but changed the rep range. The other group uh, did the same rep range, but changed the exercises. And what they found is that uh, the changing the rep ranges led to like 60% greater strength gain uh, than the group that uh, had the same rep range, but different exercises. So and by ex rep range, you mean one day you might be doing sets of six, another day you might be doing sets of 20 with lighter weight. You're talking yeah. about fluctuating the amount of reps on a regular basis. Yes, that's correct. So you want to uh, change the rep range since that's what your body adapts to the quickest. So uh, the exercises you can stick with for a long time, uh, as long as you change the order uh, and the rep range. So um, you, uh, you only really change the exercises to progressions. So, uh, you know, double leg to single leg. You're not going to be doing Bulgarian split squats, you know, early on when, until you've learned, you've mastered those foundational exercises. Um, so rep ranges, there have different training effects. So, uh, if you're always doing 15 reps on everything across the board, not only are you going to get used to it, but that's just more endurance. And so you're not going to get the muscle growth, the hypertrophy benefit, uh, 
and or the power range, strength range or power range. So you're not going to really get too much stronger. You're not going to really get explosive from that. So you need to change the rep ranges. Is the uh, give us the examples of the power of the different ranges? Like, uh, is it like two to five reps as power and so on? G give us a rough idea. And I know that I know that it's it's kind of different for everybody, and it's not an exact science. But give us a rough idea of what you'd consider uh, the amount to do on your very heavy day, and then maybe your 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 uh, heavy day, your your medium day, your light day. What are some of these ranges? Absolutely. So once they have a uh, foundation built uh, with high reps, learning those movement patterns, and then they can work in the lower rep ranges and change the rep ranges more frequently. So uh, the 15 and more reps, uh, well, actually, let me touch on this first. You have to choose the right weight for the right rep ranges, because mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll see someone with 10 or 15 pound dumbbells and the rep range on a, on a screen in group fitness will say, you know, 10 reps, but it's a weight they could do for like 30 reps. So it's not doing mm -hmm. anything for them. So you want to right. choose a weight that is appropriate for the rep range. So a weight you can barely get for that number, but one in the bank. So let's say the rep range is 10. So you want to choose a weight you can barely get for 11, one in the bank, but stop at 10. So you have a, a final rep, nice and controlled, uh, but you still have one in the bank. Because if you try to get that last, last one to a failure, it could be dangerous, it could be messy, your nervous system will record, you know, start having sloppy movement pattern. So uh, you want one in the bank. So if the rep range is 15, you choose a weight you can barely get for 16. If the rep range is six, you choose a weight you can barely get for seven. Uh, five by five, powerlifting routine. You want to be able to finish that fifth rep, not struggle on that fifth rep, because that could eventually kind of burn you out. So uh, same concept across the board. To answer your question, so uh, a weight appropriate for 15 or more endurance, it's going to... Uh, increase uh, the endurance capacity of your muscles. Um, a weight that's challenging for, let's say, 8 to 12 is going to be more muscle growth, so uh, causing more physiological changes, so uh, getting your muscles bigger. Bodybuilders spend most of their time in that, that range, but everyone has to have all rep ranges. Uh, 6 to 8 is going to be more strength, so more getting stronger uh, and some muscle growth. And then 1 to 5 is actually just neurological, just your nervous system. So you actually won't really get bigger at all. Uh, it's just going to be your nervous system recruiting more motor units, being more explosive. So it's literally mental, your nervous system. It's amazing. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yes, it's, uh, it's fascinating. So you can get, uh, for example, powerlifters, they uh, spend a lot of their time in that lower rep range, you know, one to five, five by five, or three, even a set of three or maximal efforts. And yeah. uh, it's just all neurological. And so they won't be that big. Uh, but yet they're stronger. So they're much smaller than bodybuilders, uh, but yet they're much stronger than bodybuilders. So it's interesting. From my, my history and, and my personal uh, journey of being all over the map, everything from doing a, a body transformation with Bill Phillips back in the 90s to oh, wow. doing triathlon, not with him personally, but, you know, I just read the book and did it with wow. my friend, right? So no, no like personal association there, but no, okay. but I read the book. We did that we body for life and it was incredible. I My body was literally transformed in 90 days following that program. Really enjoyed that. I did um, uh, triathlon for years. I did CrossFit. And, and throughout all that, I've done so many different types of movements and and between warm-ups and, and and then and then lifting and then body weight pull-ups muscle ups um uh, uh push-ups all, all the um uh, olympic movements overhead squats uh, etc so and and uh and what's what's funny is now i'm just working at home and i like the number seven now <laughs> so <laughs> when i go a heavy day is uh, uh, a heavy weight that I can do seven of. And then when I go a little lighter than that, I do 14 or uh, 21 I or see. 28 or or 70 in the case of like crunches, right? And I don't know why that's just me personally making that up, but I kind of feel like seven is a lucky number. Hmm. And so there you go. The, the, <laughs> the fitness world, according to Dave, works at numbers of seven, which is pretty close to what you said. Uh, uh, seven's a little more than five, uh, but f 14 is right there in that other uh, range. You know? I see what you're saying. It kind of gets you right in the middle of each reference. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Or, or I, I, it's either a good number or I'm just barely missing. 
the correct <laughs> number all the way up. I don't know, but it works for me. I like it. It feels good. And, um, uh, you know, uh, so, 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 so sometimes like, um, I'll give you an example of a 14. If I take two kettlebells, if I take a 25 pound kettlebell on each shoulder and I do alternating one hand thrusters, right? Yeah. By the time I hit 14, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> right. I feel like like that. <laughs> That's good though. Yeah. That no, sounds like you have a good, uh, I know we spoke last time on this as well. And it sounds like you have a good routine going for you. I do have a good routine. I'm always refining it. Um, uh, but all the things that you mentioned, I have strength days, I have cardio days, sure. I have flexibility and mobility days, which is what I did this morning, for example. And um, uh, I use my flexibility and mobility as recovery days. So I've also worked recovery in. Um, and then uh, I do cardio. Um, I walk uh, an hour a day. Actually, I, I do quite a long walk with my dog morning and night. So that Walking is actually an important part of my routine. Uh, and I've got the um, rowing machine. And so uh, um, a core workout for 10 minutes and a 30 minute row yeah. is a great, great cardio. Um, and then CrossFit was great for me. In, in CrossFit, uh, I learned so many different movements, everything from bands to uh, bent over single legged rows where you're balancing on, say, your left foot, but rowing uh, yes. with your right hand these types of movements cross body right i know you're a big fan of getting rid of imbalances yes and i learned that um for myself in in crossfit that when i went from one hand to another during the same movement i was very weak on one side or or uh ha ha maybe not weak but just didn't have balance in one uh, a foot um, or, and so on. And so I've come to love flexibility and mobility. When I was younger, flexibility and mobility were really just a way to warm up for the real workout. Yes, yes. I remember uh, I remember that. That used to be the uh, everyone's idea of warming up for lifting. Yes. And uh, the older I get, the more it becomes its own workout that I really appreciate and look forward to and do by itself. Um, and uh, and do get a good workout. I do build up a sweat doing just a flexibility mobility routine. Oh yes, no, that's very important uh, because muscles can get, as you know, they can get uh, tight. So uh, if someone has bad posture, their uh, you know their chest is going to get tight, uh, their back is going to get lengthened. It's actually called upper cross syndrome, very common. And uh, then they have limited shoulder mobility. It actually affects your energy levels. It affects hormones. Ah. It affects your energy levels, alertness. Uh, and you can't take deep breaths, and then it causes you to be more of a chest breather too, because your your diaphragm is kind of suppressed, and you're supposed to actually breathe uh, di diaphragmatic breathing. So uh, if you breathe right, your stomach should rise and, and like a cylinder, and then your chest uh, almost at the same time, but slightly before, uh, and that actually will increase oxygen, and uh, you're supposed to breathe that way. And if you don't breathe properly, it can actually change the structure of your rib cage because bone is living tissue and it can remodel. So over time, it's very, very fascinating. So uh, you have proper posture, proper breathing, uh, stretching. If you don't stretch, certain muscles can get tight. Others can get lengthened. I've had so many imbalances as a, before I learned how to work out. So definitely important for sure. Okay, so back to our, our new made-up person. They're wanting to get started. They've heard us now chat about all these various concepts and ideas, rep ranges, et cetera. Uh, but uh, what, what type of a program is a great way for a new person to get started and get all these benefits? Definitely. I would say um, they could start with three days a week, two to three days a week, full body, just to learn those movement patterns. Once they learn those movement patterns uh, that I mentioned previously with a personal trainer or on their own, you know, with uh, – preferably with a friend who has a better idea of those movement patterns, some experience, uh, then they could do, uh, break it down, same format, very efficient. So it could be um, a proper warm up. So something to get your circulation going, uh, then dynamic exercises like uh, bird dog, uh, yoga moves, uh, cat cow, a hip flexor stretch. Uh, and I'll, I'll touch on the importance of that later. But um, just uh, making sure you warm up and don't do static stretches necessarily because uh, static stretches lengthen the muscle and uh, it actually can make you weaker for the weight training session. Uh, so you only want to do that really typically for certain muscles like your hip flexors if they're overactive. Uh, I mean, not overactive, but uh, pulled tight or um, 
for afterwards. So dynamic exercises are better before working out. Uh, so once you've done a nice warm up, then you can progress to uh, starting with something like uh, something to activate your glutes, something for legs, something squats or weighted hip bridges. Uh, then you can do something single leg uh, that's uh, nice and functional, like a uh, reverse lunge. And uh, then you can move on to something for core. So like a cable rotation, because your core does a flexion, rotation, and anti-rotation. You don't have to do all three every time, but uh, it's nice to mix it up. So you can do a cable rotation, uh, and it allows your hips to move, which is nice. Because a Russian twist, which a lot of people are familiar with, it can be... It can be all right if uh, you have limited range of motion, but if you do too much range of motion, since your hips are pinned, it'll put pressure on your lower back, your lumbar spine, which doesn't have as much rotational ability. So uh, if you're doing that exercise, it's very limited range of motion, or standing cable rotation, you could do a nice full range since your hips are free. So after uh, legs, some core, you can then move on to uh, big muscle groups, so uh, cable press, a single arm, Cable chest press, uh, 15 reps, starting to build that foundation, 12 to 15, uh, and right into a single arm cable row. So you can literally do push and pull back to back uh, into uh, and two sets of that. So to make it easy, you could literally do a group. You can do squats, rests, uh, whatever rest period associated with that rep range. So if you're going heavy, you need to rest longer. You want to fully recover. If you're doing lighter, you can rest less. Uh, then you can do lunges, a second set of squats, second set of lunges, then move on to that cable rotation. And when you finish that first set of cable rotation, you could get into uh, that single arm cable press, single arm cable pull, then do that second set of the cable rotation, and then your other arm ch uh, press, uh, chest press on the cable and pull. And then you could do that second set, push and pull, push and pull. Or you can, uh, before moving on to the, the last pairing, which would be an overhead press. So uh, dumbbell overhead press. Uh, neutral grip is always easier on the shoulders. If you have any shoulder discomfort, it's more natural. So you can do that into a lat pull down. Same thing, a set of the overhead press, set of lat pull down, second set overhead press, second set lat pull down. And that could be it, honestly, a full body workout. Uh, or you can break it up a little more simple. So you can do uh, rounds of uh, just uh, in three, two or three pairs. So you can do squat, lunge, rotation, squat, lunge, rotation, done with uh, all three. Two sets is sufficient for higher reps. Then you can move on to the next pair, uh, dumbbell chest press, dumbbell low row, uh, overhead press, lat pull down. So four exercises, second set of each, uh, loading it uh, like that, and then be done. Or, or jump on a bike for some interval training. So it could be very efficient is what I'm saying. You don't have to be in the gym more than an hour. Honestly, 45 minutes to an hour max, including your warm-up and your cool-down. What do you think of HIIT training? It seems to be all the rage. There's a lot of good science on it that uh, if you don't have much time for exercise, that high interval and high intensity, boy, what about HIIT, high yeah. intensity interval training. Um, I've been experimenting with it myself. And um, I used to, if I'm not careful, I just kind of wait too long. I, I get distracted, right? And But when I use a clock and I, I know I'm, I'm only getting 30 seconds between, I, I like finish something, I look at my watch and then I 30 seconds later hit the next thing. I do feel like that's a really uh, a great workout. And, um, it, and it also keeps my workouts shorter. I can get an amazing workout in 30 minutes um, by doing a, a routine. But what are your thoughts on... Hit workouts. Um, it is great. It's, uh, for example, interval training is the best form of cardio in regards to uh, anti-aging. You get that hormonal boost, uh, metabolic boost. So you get that um, that that pose that oxygen deficit, where your metabolism tries to uh, catch up and boost your metabolism up to 36 hours. So uh, it's great across the board, but you have to be ready for it. So you want to build that uh, foundation. So endurance foundation. You know, some steady state. Uh, so, you know, steady walking for, you know, a period of time, uh, steady jogging for a period of time. Once you have a decent steady state cardiovascular base, then you can incorporate some intervals. Okay. Um, but uh, so it is build, build up your cardio first. Uh, just a little bit. And um, even after you are ready, uh, I would say it's great, you know, two to three times a week. But you still want to have a nice steady state day uh, if you want 
overall you know balance because uh that steady yeah. state is actually your your work capacity your endurance so if someone's just doing the intervals they'll have a lot of benefit they'll have the active recovery they'll have a lot of benefit but uh if they jump into you know if they're a recreational obstacle course racer or you know a recreational hiker they won't have the uh work capacity that they could if they incorporate like one long jog you know three to five miles once a week you know what I mean? So that that yeah. steady state day once a week or twice a week will will contribute to that cardiovascular base. I'll I'll tell you what my triathlon years were so educational, uh, because uh, obviously triathlon is endurance, and I didn't do long triathlons. I only did uh, sprint, and I, I competed best at Olympic distance, which is oh, uh, so yeah. one point two miles, um, run or, or a bike uh, twenty four, and run a ten k, more or less depending on the the length of the course. That's a lot. And uh, yeah, yeah. But but at the same time, I, I, I really was a student of it and I really studied and I found out about even though it's an endurance sport, uh, you still needed strength and your body has multiple systems. And and during that time, I I, uh, I, I wanted to if I was doing a, a, a sprint distance triathlon, I wanted to finish the run in, in 20 minutes if I could or less. And um, and there was little things like you learned that you don't become a faster runner just from running. Right. Yeah. Like if I wanted to be faster, uh, I, I had to do intervals. I had to get on a track and do 400s and 800s. And and when I when I trained that way, uh, my, my PR was actually in the national championships in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, oh. my, my fastest run ever of a 10K was 40 minutes. And I did that after swimming a mile, 1.2 miles and biking 24 miles. I got off the bike and ran a 40 minute 10 K <laughs> that's impressive. That is very impressive. Uh, but the, the funny thing about that is that it didn't come from running 10 Ks over and over and over and over. It came from doing some intervals with some, what we call tempo runs yes. mixed in with long, slow runs on a Saturday. And then we even mixed when we were on how much trail running we did versus on the road. And, Bottom line to this whole long story I'm telling you is my personal experience has showed me that changing things up, the variety, this mixture of strength and speed, the different systems of the body, cardio versus your you know me metabolic capacity, which is slightly different. And then, of course, um, mobility and flexibility came into play. The first time I tried to do a full squat when I started CrossFitting, it was embarrassing. You should have seen. I hardly uh, no. went down at all. I had nothing. <laughs> and even worse, an overhead squat. Oh. When, when, when they showed me in CrossFit what an overhead squat was, and I had all these years of endurance training, and I had become inflexible and immobile, I got the bar over my head, and I was like, there is no way I'm going down with this <laughs> thing over my head. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm telling you. There's nothing. And so I realized – all these imbalances you talked about, mine are probably very different than yours. I've, I've read your bio and I know, you know, you, you had different injuries than me and different problems. But the underlying premise was the same, that you can become very good in one area while neglecting another area, whether it's right side, left side, whether it's having no mobility, but being very strong, whether it's having lots of cardio, but being very weak. Yes. Right. Yes. And so and so the uh, the the goal here is, is to have a complete system based on what you said in the beginning, your own why, because it's not about anyone else. If you want to be a marathon runner, wonderful. That that's it. Just go out and do that. If that's your dream. Fantastic. And just give up on some of the the strength. You want your body weight to be very low, etc. So I, I get that. But but ideally, if you're not trying to do a very specific thing like a marathon or a strength competition or, um, you know, fill in the blank with a certain one type of thing you're trying to do. If your yeah. goal is to be uh, a, a fit person and, and achieve longevity, avoid injury, uh, have strength and cardio and flexibility, um, you need to plan like what you're describing. Absolutely. Something that, that, that you're doing all of those things on a regular basis. Yes. And it doesn't have to take that much time. That's the, one of the misconceptions is a lot of people have that bodybuilding mentality. And so they think they need so much volume, multiple sets, uh, multiple rep, you know, high reps, multiple sets. 
a lot of volume. Um, but that right. stems from the bodybuilding era of uh, people who were on performing enhancing drugs who needed that much volume. And so that trickles right. down to us today. And uh, we don't need that much volume. And also, uh, you don't have to be in the gym for more than an hour, including warm up and cool down. Um, also, um, a lot of people don't realize our modern lifestyle, sitting a lot. Uh, this is uh, one of the main points that uh, I think everyone needs to understand is when you sit a lot, your hip flexors get tight. And then it turns your, your glutes off. And then uh, that can lead to not only making you more quad dominant, more stress on your knees, but it can also make a little muscle called your piriformis get overactive. So it tries to help your glutes out. So then it can get bigger and cause um, sciatic pain because your sciatic nerve goes through or under. And, uh, uh, and so that could cause sciatic pain just because that muscle is overactive. But also, um, your, if your glutes are weak, your nervous system tries to find uh, stability and so it has a protect, it creates a protective tension. So it'll actually tighten, uh, your nervous system is the governing agent. So it's, uh, it's, you know, all knowing it tries to find the path of least resistance, tries to find stability in places sometimes where it shouldn't. So if your glutes are weak, it'll tighten a muscle called your TFL. It sounds like a Starbucks drink. It's a tensor faster latte. Uh, it'll pull on your <laughs> IT band. And so, uh, it'll literally tighten your IT band to provide that stability. So people think I need to stretch my IT band. So they'll stretch this band that they can't even really stretch uh, when really all they have to do is activate certain muscles to release that protective tension. So if you, imme if you activate your glute medius immediately, your uh, iliocibial band is more relaxed and you can actually reach further. It's crazy. If you is it a set of air squats good enough to do that? Um, I would say that could help or uh, side laying, uh, laying on your side, lifting your, your leg to the side, uh, but not pointing your toe up because you'll be using your hip flexors. You'd have to have your foot parallel or leading with your heel to feel the top part of your glutes. But by activating your glute medius, it's the weakest muscle in everybody and it stabilizes your hips. Uh, by activating that, it'll relieve that protective tension most people have because their glutes are weak. And so you won't feel that tightness as much. Uh, and just by strengthening glutes and working on that hip mobility, a lot of issues go away. Hmm. It's uh, everybody has most people have hip issues or knee issues because their hips are locked up. It's uh, it's interesting. Common common patterns, common distortion patterns. And a lot of people have sciatic problems and pain. And yep. so, and uh, what you're saying is this could be a cause uh, for some of these people to look into. It could be what they're dealing with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of them are easy, easy, relatively easy fixes, just strengthening certain muscles. And so um, you need to give us like a PDF or something with all these ideas. I mean, you have your program. Tell us about your program. How does that work? Um, so I'm working on uh, right now. I'm a little caught up with a different business venture. Uh, but once that is complete, which is almost complete, uh, it's uh, it's not fitness related, but uh, I am working on a book. Uh, called New Exist. It's uh, simplifying, simplifying your exercise experience. And I'm halfway through with it. So this book, I would like to um, begin publishing this year to have it out by next year. Okay. And uh, it's the foundation of, of my fitness brand, which will be all about uh, simplifying working out, uh, educating others, so empowering others with fitness education. So it'll be online courses. Uh, it's newexist.com, N-E-U-X-I-S-T, the website is up, but the new website isn't up. So I would say uh, follow me on social media. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook, uh, John Simos or Jonathan Simos. Um, my Instagram is J-O-N-S-I-M-O-S. -S. So uh, you can follow me for updates, and I will launch that within a year to help others with their uh, fitness. Cool. Do you have anything available now? Do you have a PDF ebook or anything like that? Uh, yes, I can send you. I'll send you a, uh, a PDF of uh, certain exercises to do and uh, some key points as well. Uh, sure. For your viewers. That would be great. Yeah, send us a PDF so they got something that, you know, I think it's been fantastic to talk to you. And you and I, it's a little bit of inside baseball. We both love this stuff and we're both, we're both doing it. But a lot of the things that you said, I think people can rewind. They can listen to and whatnot. Uh, but anything you give that would kind of uh, uh, just be like a list of here, here's some great exercises. Here's like here's a great sample. Here's a good warm up. Like w maybe, uh, you know, one of the things you talked about was three days a week, a new person doing three days a week. Could you could you just put something simple together of, hey, here's 
here's what I do for you. Uh, day one, do this. Day two, day this, do this. And day three, do this. And just kind of give us a, a list based on some of these things you've shared. Absolutely. I'll, I'll create a, um, a nice uh, general workout um, and also uh, key, key points to make sure they change the order and some uh, things to remember and some guidance for sure. I'll put that. Yeah, and put your put your uh, your website on it so that people remember who you are and to go to your website later when you have a more uh, ro a robust program going. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be terrific. Thank you, Dave. No, I'll definitely put that together for you. Absolutely. And you'll have a you have a couple months. Uh, we're recording this in March, but I'm about two months out on on publishing because I've got so many interviews in in the hopper. And so there's no pressure. You don't have to rush this little PDF out. Also, you don't even have to make a PDF. You just give me a Word doc. I'll have my graphic designer turn it into nice. a PDF. And we'll help each other out. If you'll give me the, the guts of it, I'll have my graphic designer pretty it up and turn it into a PDF. And we'll, we'll, we'll give it back to you. How about that? I love it. I love it. I'll definitely I'll get that to you. And uh, I'll try to get the, uh, the website redone before then as well. So it'll be polished. Well, fantastic. Well, Jonathan, it's fun to catch up with you again and talk about these ideas. I think they're powerful concepts. Uh, we, we want to inspire more people in our society to, to be more fit, right? Life is better when you're fit. There's just no doubt about it. We live our whole life through our body. And the better our body performs and functions and looks, right? Yes, I Happier we are. I agree. Well, closing thoughts, Jonathan. Um, what message would you like to leave with my audience before we let you go? I would say uh, just don't get uh, for them not to get discouraged and just to uh, take it one day at a time and understand it's your journey and uh, everyone starts somewhere. And that uh, also uh, injuries may happen or, or things that pop up, but uh, it's a part of the journey, the challenges and being adaptable and resilient. So what you learn along the way uh, in regards to fitness and also uh, just overcoming things is, is a part of it. So just don't get discouraged. Take it one day at a time, for sure. Okay, well, thanks so much. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show for uh, your, your second uh, time here on the Dairobi Health Show. Thank you for having me on, Dave. I appreciate it. Okay, and for those of you listening, this is Dave Sherwin wishing you health and success.